Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through uh, these verses that we look at now in this letter. Lord, I pray that you will uh, challenge us, inspire us, encourage us, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you for how it um, speaks to us so clearly about our lives, about our actions, and about our, ultimately about our relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that if there was a small group of us, Lord, it would really impact us all, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, one of the overarching themes that's been throughout the whole of this chapter, in fact, throughout a lot of Hebrews, is just keep going, don't give up. Yeah. Um, keep persevering, keep keep running. Um, if you're weary, I was, I was sharing at a staff meeting this morning just how tired I am at the moment, so you know, so Jack's just not sleeping. Yeah. Um, and it's been a busy all couple of weeks. Um, so he's saying if you're weary, if you're tired, if you're, in these these people's cases, being persecuted, feeling, um, the you know persecuted for their faith don't give up don't shrink back don't get weary um and really as a to not put a finer point on it the the danger of slipping back yeah isn't just that oh paul will lose some of his converts on his numbers like he's sat there to get oh no i've lost some of the people that i got saved the danger ultimately of it, of it is, is rejecting god is doing what we call apostasy and it's ultimately an eternity in hell. And that's the danger. This is the really the underlying thing here uh, that the writer of Hebrews is saying. It's like people keep persevering because if you don't persevere, then in the light of eternity it would appear that you never really knew Christ. And 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 that's the, the danger that we have here. It's the keeping on going, it's the keeping faithfully following after uh, God, which we'll get to in verses 16 and 17, when it talks about Esau and how and how he gave up his birthright. Um, for uh, for some soup, for some meat, for what they call it, potage. I don't know if that's the right way of putting it, but anyway, that's what a lot of the commentators call it, potage. Um, that you say, don't give up, don't give up your inheritance that you have. Keep running. Um, so the verses that we talked about last week, I'll just read those just to set the context where we're going now. So it says, for the moment, all discipline, remember we talked about discipline last week, seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Verse 14. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. So we'll just stop there. As I said, the encouragement is remain faithful even during God's discipline, even during suffering, even when we feel like God isn't there, remain faithful faithful keep persevering the danger is that these converts because of either the suffering that going through the disciplining of the lord the struggle the persecution that's come for following christ are gonna pull back um as we talked about last week they won't see the sanctifying effect of suffering you, you can choose two options really when suffering comes along or when god disciplines us we can either turn and reject him and we're like, I don't want anything to do with you. Again, like we talked about last week, a misunderstanding of his fatherly love for us. You know, we discipline your child and they immediately just reject you. You're trying to protect them. You're trying to love them and they will just run away straight away. We can do that sometimes. We definitely can. Um, or we can turn and cling to them, cling to God. And we can turn into, into, to, into him and realize that he is looking after us in our suffering, even though um, it's tough, it's for our good. So they won't see the sanctifying effect, they won't see the strengthening of their resolve, they won't see the honour of suffering as Christ did. I don't know what the expression is, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes things can make you weaker. It's like sticks and stones are brave, but those are words will never harm me. That's ridiculous, of course they harm me. I'd rather be hit with a stone sometimes than be uh, discouraged by people's words. Uh, but yeah, the sense that our struggling and our, our suffering does strengthen us. In our resolve to know that God is faithful. If everyone was so easy and there was never any struggles, then we would not know God's faithfulness as much as we do. And lastly, they won't see the honor of suffering as Christ did. You know, when Paul, I can't remember which one of his letters, but he said he just wanted to know Christ so much, he wanted to suffer as Christ did, he wanted to just be as close to Jesus as possible, even to the point of, of knowing him in his death, knowing him in his, in his suffering, knowing him in his crucifixion. Isn't that an incredible depth of love for Christ? just to want to know him and to experience everything that he went through. So, if they, if they do not see that the chances are it will follow through, that they won't live at peace with each other and they won't continue to grow in holiness. So, 
if they get bitter, as we're going to look at in a second, if they um, struggle to see what God's doing in his sovereignty, then they'll abandon peace. And usually a person that isn't at peace with themselves is going to struggle to be at peace with people around them. So it says, work at living in peace. So praise God, it says work at. It doesn't just say, do it, like a command kind of thing, like you've got to get this right. Get it right first time. It says work at living in peace with everyone. Because it's not easy, is it? Um, everyone. So not just the people that we like, we get along with happy to have in our homes, happy to go out for a coffee with, happy to spend our free time with, that's easy to have peace with them. But what did Jesus say? He said, love our enemies, pray for our enemies, you know, pray that there'll be blessing upon our enemies. So it's not just the people that we like. So it's, it is a, it's a strong thing, but work at living in peace with everyone. Hugh Henry writes, faith and patience will enable them to follow peace and holiness, okay? If the readers of this letter give in to the sufferings they are going through, then you can bet it will show its first signs in a lack of peace with people around them and a lack of holy living. So he says, work at living in peace with everyone and work at, holy, at living a holy life. So he's, he's linking the two. It's almost, it's really as if he's saying, a lot of the time when we're not at peace with God, sin will seem so much more attractive. When we're not aware of God's sovereign hand in our lives, we'll see suffering and that will then create in us a weariness that will then likely lead to sinning because we'll think well God's not on our side why was he put me through this again that's, a, that's not understanding God's sovereignty and his role and in, in, in his discipline and his training of us but then we turn on him and then we look to other things and you can see that in our own lives where we've kind of perhaps been distant from God other things then become more attractive and then we can end up sinning and we can end up you know going it's that prodigal son he had a loving father, his brother, but then for whatever reason, he thought that getting that money early was best. And, you know, leaving his family and he just wanted the immediate pleasure and I'm going to go and get that. And then, praise God, it's an, it's an example of the fact that God can bring us back from that and put us right when we realise the error of our ways and we realise just how lesser the thing we've taken is. Um, and how better God is and he comes back and what does the Father do? He embraces him. Um, I think we mentioned this last week again and, and loves him and was always ready for him to come home, which is an incredible thing, isn't it? Um, but yeah, but we, this is why peace is so much so important. So work at living in peace with everyone. So there's a knock-on effect to everyone. This is the kind of thing of these verses. There's a knock-on effect, not just from the personal, but the outward. So if I'm not at peace with myself or with God, then likeliness is I'll not be at peace with other people and my living a holy life will be affected as well and this is a really stark warning here it says um sorry guys i've not put the verse up um it says uh those who are not holy will not see the lord those who are not holy will not see the lord and ultimately what this is saying here is again it's this trajectory of travel that if there's not something within us that is growing and i say growing because in continued corruption within our bodies and in our flesh i don't believe until jesus returns there'll be a day where sin isn't attractive to us but we grow in holiness we grow in sanctification but if that trajectory isn't happening then we have no right to be assured that we will see the lord if we love the things that the things of the world that are sinful and we're rejecting the things that god says is good why should you have any assurance why should you look at that person who clearly is just living for the you know, for the world and well, the lusts of the flesh or whatever it might be and rejects the things of God, might say they're a Christian, might turn up to church, but why should they have any assurance? And ultimately here is that warning. It's not saying that we're saved through works. It's saying that works will be a result of our salvation. Someone question whether they're a Christian, you look at the fruit of their lives, don't you? You're not looking for perfection, but you're looking and thinking, do you love the things that God loves? And are you wrestling with the things that God wants you to wrestle with, that this Holy Spirit will wrestle with in you. Um, it's about this sort of trajectory. Excuse me, let me just move on quite quickly. I've often said that to know truly whether you are, you could be assured of your salvation, to know whether someone else is, whether ultimately God knows whether someone's saved, but at the same time, you can see, is there a wrestling match going on? Or are they living a life where 
you'd be sinning, doing stuff that you know you shouldn't be doing, but there isn't any wrestling match. It's just accepted. It's just a, yeah, I don't care. That's a worrying place to be. That's a place where it would seem the Holy Spirit is not indwelling, and that, oh dear, a <laughs> tree fall over. <laughs> a tree falls in a church and no one's around to hear it. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, where was that? Uh, I lost my train of thought. Yes, that the wrestling match within us is proof that the Holy Spirit is, is within us and he's sanctifying us and he's saying, don't do that, Andy, that's not good for you. Um, stop doing that, and that is proof that, um, that the Holy Spirit is within you. So again, Matthew Henry, who I've read a bit for this, says, peace and holiness are connected together. There can be no true peace without holiness. And that's the case, everyone, like, praise God, he causes us to not have peace when we're living in sin. If he just left us to our own devices without any warning, that would not be a good father. That's like a child just doing stuff they know they shouldn't be doing, and the dad just looks on and doesn't warn them. But the Holy Spirit convicts us, tells us, oh, that's not something that's good for you. Do this, do what my word says for your joy and for God's glory um, and for your betterment. This is what he, he asks us to do. That to be true, a true follower of Jesus is to be in constant turmoil until holiness is pursued. I'm not saying that to be a Christian means that you should be unhappy all the time and always, but it is a constant war. It's a constant wrestling. It's a constant sense of saying, I'm going to reject what the word world has for us and choosing what God has for us instead. There's a war that we're raging on within us. Um, again, but that is proof that the Lord loves, loves us very dearly. So, verse uh, 15. Well, let me just read this first, actually. 2 Timothy 2.21 reads, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonourable, he will be a vessel for honourable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. And that's really that in pursuing holiness, we're setting ourselves ready to be used by God. So it's not just that we will be at peace. We're not just seeking it so I can just be relaxed. Oh, I'm not sinning. Oh, I don't have to worry. It's that we can be used by God. It's that we can be used by him for the many different things that he would have us to do. Okay. So continuing in verse 15. Nice encouragement for us all. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. So to hook this back to what the chapter has previously been talking about, look out for each other so that those around you don't miss. So basically don't misunderstand life sufferings again. Don't misunderstand the chastisement that comes from God. Don't misunderstand what you're going through, that somehow God's just rejected you and just dropped you. That's not the case. Don't don't misunderstand that. We need to help people through the struggles of the life in the church. Look after each other that so none of you fails to receive the grace of God because ultimately you could fail to receive the grace of God if you misunderstand what you're going through and then reject God, turn your back on God. So without a robust understanding of suffering and how God sovereignly rules over us as his children, there's danger that we can reject and we can turn and we can this word apostatize, but we can walk, people walk away from God, don't they? And bitterness is mentioned here, which I just, when I think of bitterness, um, I don't actually think of like a taste necessarily. I, I think of, and this is really strange, but I think of like stickiness. <laughs> because whenever I've been bitter, or whenever I've seen someone who's bitter, to me, it's like, it's just so sticky. It's hard to get rid of it. It's like a, it's a, it's a, a position, a, a state of mind where it kind of it, it gets its, uh, you know, gets its roots into every part of your life. It steals your joy. Um, you bring it up in conversation for no reason. You know, the thing that you're better about, you can almost turn that, if it's a person that's wronged you, you can turn that, any situation into, oh, well, that's because they did this to me. And it's a sticky, if that makes sense, it might be a bit weird, but it's like a sticky, sinful situation to be in. Uh, bitterness, a resentment towards God, those who have not fulfilled your expectations or people who have let you down, will grow bitter roots that can destroy acceptance of yourself and of others. And for me, one of the things I think about when I think about bitterness in my own life, I see in, in other people's lives is 
But I, I don't know, just this thing of like life is so short, you know? We have this moment of time to serve God, to glorify Him, to know His love in our lives, and then to be with Him for eternity. Life's too short to be bitter. Doesn't mean it's easy at all, but it breaks your heart when you see someone going through it um, because you just think, oh, the Lord would wish you to be free from that. You know, life's so short. Don't waste your time being being bitter. Was it was it Winston Churchill? I might be, might be giving him this quote, and it's not his. It said, "Bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You drink poison and expect the other person to die." Which yeah. is quite a good thing, isn't it? That the bitterness affects you. You're not getting them at all. You're not hurting them. You're not telling them off. You're just at home feeling angry, feeling like I've been wronged, and they're just like, eh, they're just carrying on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it it is. It's like drinking poison and then watching for them to drop dead, and they're absolutely all right. There's no way to live. Have to remember how we've been forgiven. This is the this is the answer, the antidote. And again, it makes things so sort of easy. It's not, but the answer is to have a, such a compelling view of Christ's cross for us and everything we've been saved from. That therefore, even when we are very wronged, it's almost the answer of, well, Lord, you've forgiven me. And again, this 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 whole this me talking now for the next twenty seconds this could be a lifetime of like wrestling with this and the Lord helping you to grow through this because people have been through such horrible things overcoming that and forgiving them so difficult but with God's help you can see the forgiveness in your own life and then extend it to that person um, in some remarkable ways I'm sure you can think of situations where you've heard on the news or you've heard read about people forgiving people that have done horrific things to them um, it's just not you know it can be astonishing Wherever I've read, you know, testimonies of Christians that were in the death camps in, in Auschwitz who forgave the Germans uh, did it to them, you know, years later visited them, uh, you know, as elderly people and hugged them and forgiven them. That's incredible, isn't it? But what a picture of God's love for us in that. Um, Acts eight twenty three reads, unresolved anger produces bitterness. And the, the Bible links bitterness with being in bondage to sin. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So again, there's this kind of connection that when we're bitter, there's a, like a door opens to other sins. You know, one might lead to the other. It just, it, it can't, it's like a chink in the, arm, in the armor. It's, a, it's a letting the enemy in if, we're, if we struggle, if we let ourselves be in bitterness for too long. Other things can come along that God would want for, for us. Theological Hunt writes this, and you can know the same, your trial will make you either bitter or better. Following conflict, what keeps your heart from negative focus? Jesus said, love your enemies. If you're saying, but they really aren't enemies, realize that if someone evokes resentment, bitterness, or hatred, that person is an enemy to your spirit. Because praying for your enemy is commanded by Christ, Believers should obey this directive and not regard this as optional. And because praying for your enemy protects your heart from bitterness, you should want to obey this directive in heart and in deed. One approach is to pray the fruit of the Spirit for your offender. And because you are willing to bless your enemy, the Bible says, says you will in inherit a blessing. 1 Peter 3 9. And the theologian Moffat Gantry wrote the following uh, that talks about the root of bitterness. Self is the tumour of the soul, and it grows by what it feeds on. You cannot cure it by a few good resolutions. It requires the most drastic treatment, and Christ prescribes crucifixion as the only way of destroying this root of every kind of bitterness. And my friend Spurgeon again <laughs> says, Sin is a bitter thing and a defiling thing. And unless we look diligently, it will grow in our hearts like the weeds grow in our gardens after a heavy rain. It's true, isn't it? And it's and it's having the awareness to know when we're when we're bitter, or when we're resentful, or when we're in that state. Because often it might be someone having to tell you from the outside, because you might just think, "Well, I'm not. I'm fine. It, it's not bothering me." When someone from the outside might look at you and be like, "That it really is bothering you. You're growing a bitterness, and it's opening doors all over the place to, to, to bad behaviour." And it actually goes on in this verse. We can think this is just a personal thing again. Well, I'm bitter. Leave me alone. Leave me in my bitterness. I'm not hurting anybody. But that's not true because it says, poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. What corrupting many. 
corrupting many. So this has an effect. Do you know that like bitterness can damage the culture of a church? You get a couple of bitter people in a church and the conversation is just negative, resentful, angry with God. That can be toxic. That can spread pretty quickly. I'm no gardener at all, so it's hard to tell what isn't weed in my, not weed as in weed weed, but <laughs> as in weeds in my garden. I'm not growing marijuana in, in uh, Almondbury. But uh, it's hard to tell, there's probably more weeds than there are grass. But what I do know is that they spread quickly. You get one or two and then the whole thing. And I actually think dandelions are quite nice, but I've been informed they're actually weeds. <laughs> so you shouldn't put like, Eleanor loves them. Picks them up and likes to blow them and they're really pretty. So I'm like, yeah, let the dandelions spread. But apparently it's not good for the ground and they're not, yeah, they're, they're not flowers. They look like flowers to me. I'm sure someone can tell me what the difference between a weed and a flower is, but you know, they look they look flowery. But it can spread, it can spread out. And whether or not you've known in a friendship group, you've had one person who's perhaps been really bitter. You know, it can stain the conversation, can drag down positivity, trying to be an encouraging time, trying to have a happy time, and it's just, there's almost a cloud around a person. It's helping that person, isn't it? And it's praying for them. Um, but equally, it's also looking at ourselves and thinking, am I, do I need to talk to a person? Do I need to say, uh, do you know that offended me or that upset me and I really want to forgive you? Help me, that's, that's okay. Help me to forgive you because that person might be shocked and might think, I didn't know I put you through that. I didn't know I came across like that. Um, you know, I was talking to someone recently about how uh, emails can be such a, not a great form of communication. You know, you sometimes can't hear the heart behind someone when you read an email. You put your own tone on it, you put your own emphasis on it. And you can read an email and just be really crushed. And uh, then you talk to the person in the flesh and they're just like, I didn't, I didn't mean that at all. I was actually really encouraged by what you were doing, but I was just trying to constructively criticize that. <laughs> they just came across as unconstructive criticism. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's always wise to talk to the person uh, to see where, you know, where it, where it came from. Theologian called Barclay says that the Greeks defined, and it's, I hope I'm saying this right, Pakria, and this is a bitterness, as long-standing resentment, as a spirit which refuses to be reconciled. So many of us have a way of nursing our wrath to keep it warm. I think that's a good way of putting it. Of brooding over the insults and the injuries which we have received. Every Christian might well pray that God would teach him to forget. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, I know I run things through my mind, scenarios of getting even. You know, oh, I'll say this, I'll say that, I'll be so witty and clever. And then <laughs> that will then destroy the argument and they'll be like, ah, oh, I realised I was wrong. You know, and you can run these hard, sinful things through your mind uh, to get back at people. It goes, it goes further on to say that it also has the, the connotation of, of like a mob, of bringing confusion. I don't know if you've ever like watched on the news like a riot or a group of people all protesting. It's far from peaceful. It's like a, a almost a confusion of, 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 of different words and shoutings and tension and discontent and you don't know what's gonna happen next, the windows are gonna be smashed or the police are trying to keep them controlled and it, it is a sense of that, that the bitterness can like fly out in different areas and it's almost the opposite of peace and it it's a, it's like a, a crowd, a crowd mob mentality almost within our our own souls, which is not a good place to be, is it? During World War II, this is similar to our, which we're saying was Winston Churchill, I'm not sure it was about the poison thing, but in World War II, the submarine, um, US submarine tank surfaced under the cover of darkness to fire upon a large Japanese convoy off the coast of China. Since previous raids had left the American vessel with only eight torpedoes, the accuracy of every shot was absolutely essential. The first seven missiles were right on target. But when the eighth was launched, it suddenly deviated and headed right back at their own ship. The emergency alarm to submerge rang out, but it was too late. Within a matter of seconds, the US sub received a direct hit and sank almost instantly. Instead of doing battle with the enemy, Christians often use God's word like a torpedo to attack one another. With precisely any missiles of criticism, contempt or callousness, we can cripple the body of Christ, of which we are all members. Can it sink someone else's end of the boat and still keep your own afloat? 
thought that was brilliant. <laughs> Thinking we're all in the same boat together. We're all going to shoot a rocket at that side and hopefully it won't affect me. We're all going to go down, guys. Uh, that's very worth thinking about, isn't it? Um, and it's the same with, with, with bitterness. That could be a small leak. Um, you know, I, 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 there's various theories actually out now why the Titanic sank. Um, but apparently, like, comparative, comparison to the size of the ship where the iceberg hit wasn't like a ginormous gash, like it was, but, but a small amount suddenly flooded one compartment and the next, didn't get the doors up, and it flooded, 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 and then it was lilted and went, we know it went down. So a small level of bitterness in our lives, much like the leaven talked about in the Old, in the Old Testament, can seep through and take over. Verse 16 says this, Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. I mean, I guess what's, what's staggering about this is that, he's draw that the writer of Hebrews is drawing the parallel that we can be so... I guess, undervaluing of our inheritance, undervaluing of what Christ has done for us, that we could have the potential for <coughs> accepting something else in rejection of that. You know, whatever sin it could be, but it's almost like, oh, I'm gonna go drink, have this soup. That's how, that's how little Esau saw his birthright, his inheritance. We put our salvation into that side of the equation. Like, we look at Jesus with such, um, less value we just see our, our relationship with him is something not as important that we could just walk away from it to accept something as little as a bowl of soup i know for certain that in, if you if you come to the lord repentance and in tears over what you've done he's going to accept that we know that from his word who what we see here is a heart that is so hardened that even in his tears he's not seeing the value Really what Esau is doing here is he, he wants the, the birthright back. Perhaps he wants the value of it back, like, but not, not the true intrinsic value of, the, of, of what it was. You know, it might be that someone um, turns their back on God, then realizes, oh, I don't have any more friends. Or, um, you know, I've lost my opportunity to be on stage. And then they come back wanting that not to know Christ again, not because they're returning to church because they want to know the Lord or become repentant, but it's just they've lost the other things that come with it, you know? And maybe that's what Esau thought. His heart had become so hard and he didn't realize the value of what he had, that even in his, even with bitter tears. Um, so you can look at it in two ways. I think it, it doesn't disturb me too much because I think it's a warning to us to never get to that place. Mm -hmm. To value Christ so much that we would never get to a point where a bowl of soup <laughs> would be comparative to our Savior, you know? And, and that's okay. The Bible's full of warnings like this kind of thing to keep us on the straight and narrow. Um, and to, 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 yeah, to make us aware. And we can think of perhaps people that we've seen that have done this. And we would say, heartbreakingly, that's so sad that's happened. But Lord, oh, keep me faithful, Lord. Keep me from ever drifting, thinking that that sin isn't going to be that bad, but then the next gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And by the time we've woken up, we're absolutely miles away from where God ever wanted us to be. That, that's, that's possible. It, it's possible for any of us. Any of us. I've written here, Esau thought so little of the promises of God to Abraham and Isaac, so little of his birthright inheritance that he sold those rights to his brother Jacob. For a bowl of stew so questions to us is do we value our inheritance do we value what the lord has done for us do we value jesus christ enough that we won't give him up for some soup or because we might think that's very unlikely i don't even like soup but for a promotion <laughs> gained by deceptive means or for more money for short-term pleasure for decisions made in anger or rage you know th these are the real things that come up where we would think and I've been in positions definitely where you can just think that I'm just going to not do what, what God has asked me to do. I'm going to go for short-term pleasure. This is where the danger lies. The way to not fall for the same mistake is to grow in love more and more with Jesus every day. 
that's the that's the the warning that's the way to help us to avoid making the same mistake so i thought just in kind of wrapping up um so we've talked about uh, living at peace with everybody so the people that you know that you're going to need to work on i'm not saying that it's like click your fingers you just got to be at peace with everybody but the people that you think i really struggle with that person and actually they're a brother or sister in christ maybe in the church and i need to ask for your help lord i need to communicate with them to grow in my relationship with them because it won't be your friends and any people that you, you, you get along with that you need to work on it'll, it'll be people that you're struggling with so the lord the, God, the lord can help you to to progress in that look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of god so look around the church look at people in your own life that you think can i help them to see what they're going through um through the lens of scripture through the lens of what god is trying to do them can i help them to see it more, more than just one dimensionally that i'm just i'm just i'm just unlucky or life's just rubbish but actually god has a purpose uh, for his children in our sufferings think about bitterness that's the kind of affect us all there'll be things i could think back in my life that i've been very bitter about family member um i was so angry with for so many years so bitter um, and I didn't think I was ever going to get over that someone that hurt my dad and it was almost a it was an honor thing or it was being protective of my dad but I I thought righteously even I am able to be angry with that person and they've done wrong and God would God would support me in my bitterness rubbish <laughs> not at all um, he would not and uh, and God slowly worked on me to be able to forgive that person and to almost to say you know Lord yours you're, you're, you're to deal with him it's not for me to get right with him or to get even with him yeah, it's for you um make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau and again the emphasis is upon us to check around to look around and think is that person a step away from rejecting God walking away from God for something less so it's emphasis is on us here to have our eyes open um and to protect ourselves and just to go back is almost like this chapter 12 and helps itself at the beginning because the answer to all this in closing i believe is at the beginning of the chapter uh, which we looked at a few weeks ago where it says this therefore chapter verse one therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles stuff we've been talking about whether that's bitterness how it entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us how fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So the answer to all of this, you know, Esau took his eyes off his inheritance, he took his eyes off what God wanted for him. Ultimately, it's keeping our eyes on Christ. And we say that a lot, and when we sing it, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus, practically what it means to dwell upon the sacrifice of Jesus, to dwell upon the love he had for us, to think about just how sinful I was, and just how loving Jesus you were for, to me. Thinking upon that, it's, it's all the time, in being in the word of God, reading about Jesus, reading about all that he's done for us, that fixes our eyes on him. Um, and it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see how almost the beginning of the chapter answers the, how we do uh, 14 to 17? That we do not grow weary and lose heart think about Christ. It will warm your heart, build your faith, encourage you as you think upon Christ. Because when we think about Christ and all that he's done for us, as a child of God, it can only bring about joy and, uh, and a smile upon our faces because of the love that Jesus has for us. I know in my own life that I've struggled when I've not, when I've drifted from that practice. Think upon, think upon him. Let me pray. Father God, I ask that you would help us to look at you, Jesus. I pray that you'd help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. I pray, Lord, that whatever is in our minds right now that um, burdens us, perhaps there's things that we're bitter about, perhaps there's things that we need to go help in forgiving people with. Lord, I pray you'd remind us that you're so kind and so patient with us and you would only would ask that we would just ask for your help. And you're so ready to give it to us, Lord. Pray, Lord, that we would never feel reluctant in coming to you, 
You're so gracious to us, so merciful with us. Remind us, Lord, of the cross and how definitive it was, how it covered us completely, how you're not surprised by our sin, how you're not, you're not shocked by it, Lord, that you, that's why you died. You didn't come, Lord, for the, the well, you came for the sick. And Lord, we acknowledge that we need you. So be with us this week in all that we're going to be doing. Um, give us opportunities, Lord, to, to speak for you, to witness for you. And when we have time, Lord, just to sit in your presence, to sit, uh, read your word, to sit to speaking to you in prayer, and we grow in love in our relationship with you above everything else I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.